junior year and at that point I had stopped playing football I was playing football at Washburn University I had stopped and I was like you know what I'm gonna take my talents to a different sport let's try basketball you know I wasn't getting any offers coming out of a high school but one of my coaches said I could play so let's give let's give this basketball thing a chance so I sent all of my recruitment video out to as many people as I possibly can I, I heard some feedback not as much as I would like uh, Colorado did email me back and I was like oh he won Colorado emailed me back and said no thanks, but I did get the email, so I'm going to hold on to that. There was a small school up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, D3, Northwestern College, you can look it up, it's a real college, I promise you. They wanted me. So, uh, yeah, give it up for me, you know, like, they wanted me. But they hadn't seen any of my film, they just thought I was a good guy, so. Then, there was this school that was known by the name of UTEP, all right? UTEP, University of Texas, El Paso. I had absolutely no idea where the school was at other than the actual name El Paso, right? I didn't know where El Paso was actually at. I didn't know much about the school, uh, so I started doing some research, and uh, a coach actually ended up calling me. I got his voicemail uh, to this day. Uh, the coach, his name was Tim Floyd. And uh, you look at this picture, initially you're like, oh, there's not much to this guy. He's a good coach, you want coach. But when I started doing some more research, this guy has some status, all right? He, he was an NBA coach. He coached for the Bulls. He was a head coach. I was like, oh, this is like a big deal. Like, I've got a voice memo or a voicemail from an NBA coach, right? I started doing some more research, started to realize he's actually in the top ten. He's one of the top 10 worst NBA coaches of all time. I was like, oh, this is great. I don't know if this is a great start, but he's still an NBA coach. And I actually found an excerpt um, from an article about him. It said, once the Bulls won their sixth championship, the team was disbanded. Answers Tim Floyd, the coach who left me a voicemail. Tim Floyd was announced as the new head coach in July 1998. Things certainly didn't go as well as Jerry Krause would have liked. In the lockout short the NBA season 1999, Chicago posted a 13-37 record, the worst in the Eastern Conference. It gets worse. In 1999 to 2000, the Bulls were 17-65. And in 2001, when Tim Floyd led the team to a 15-67 mark, the worst in franchise history. He began his fourth season with a 4-21 record. He was on pace to have the worst NBA work record of all time. But he quit. He saw the right on the wall and said, I'm out of here. And so he quit, ended up going to USC, 
got in trouble there at USC. They kicked him out, they fired him, and then this is when he ended up at UTEP, knocking on my door, right? I knew all this, but I was like, D1, let's go. Like, I'm in. Like, I'm in with you, Tim Floyd. I don't care about the past. Forget and forget. Let's move on, you know. Me and you, we're going to go do something at UTEP. And uh, he emailed me and he said, uh, first of all, I, I feel like I should have been having a phone conversation with him at this point. But he emailed me and he was like, hey, we got a spot for you, a walk-on spot. I was like, wow. This is everything I've ever wanted. D1, I've, I've worked my entire life for this, a walk-on spot at UTEP. I didn't know what conference they were in, but they were they were Division One, right? Two weeks later, he emailed me back and said, "Oh, sorry, by the way, one of our guys that we thought was going to transfer didn't transfer. You no longer have a spot." It's like, oh, Tim, my future was in your hands. You just crushed my dreams. But uh, thankfully, I transferred to Kansas State University and ended up at Pike, and my athletic career hit its pinnacle at Intramurals Pike. We got to the fourth round. All right, I'll take that. But it's kind of crazy to think about it. A lot of times our futures really are in the hand of somebody else's word. And uh, we're going to start a series here at Late Night over the next couple of weeks that I'm pumped about. I'm pumped you guys decided to show up. Because some of the things that we're going to be talking about the next couple of weeks really could change your life. Really could change your walk with God. It really could change where it's hurting. I'm excited about where we're going from here. Because some of you guys might have come off of last semester. Maybe you actually placed your trust in Christ for the first time. That's not a small thing. That's amazing. That's one of the most, it is the most important decision that you can make is place your trust in Christ. If that was you last semester, then this is going to be a great opportunity for you these next couple of weeks. Because what we're going to do is we're going to take it from there. Where do you go after you place your trust in Christ? How do you grow? How do you mature? How do you become more like it? How do you live with purpose? Maybe you came off of SMC and SMC was the first time you placed your, your faith in Christ. Same thing's true of you for this, this semester. Maybe you're still on that, in that spot where you're like, hey, I am just investigating. I came here with a friend. I'm just checking it out. This is going to be a great forecast of what it would look like and what it would mean for you if you did place your trust in Christ. There's a purpose. There's a direction. God's got something for you. Tonight, though, we're going to look at the Word. We're going to look at what God has to say about His Word. And uh, the reason why we're starting here is because I think there's no possible place that you could actually start. And if you were to pick a spot, we absolutely have to start here at the Word. Some things that you can get excited about next couple weeks, let me give you a little bit of taste. We're going to be looking at how, to, how, how you interact with God and listen to Him through His Word tonight. How do you actually communicate with God in ways that will grow your intimacy with Him? And then even your ability to pray to Him, to talk to Him, and to move Him to act, the God of the universe. The universe. There's a way to pray in such a way. And then we're going to learn how to interact with others who share the same faith. How do we leverage the people around us who are actually pursuing this as well? How do we conduct ourselves as believers? Our character, our leadership, who we are. How do we make decisions? A couple weeks from now, we're going to look at relationships. How does God want us to do relationships? A couple weeks from now, we're actually going to do what's called a Valentine's dessert. We're going to bring in a godly couple. The O's and the O's of how God brought them together and how they placed God at the forefront of their relationship. We're going to get to hear that from them in a couple weeks. So get excited about that. We'll have some more details coming down the pipe for you on that. And then we're going to learn how do we interact with those who don't believe or share, uh, who don't believe the same thing that we believe. How do we share it in a relevant way? But tonight we're going to start with where we've absolutely got to start. We've got to, we've got to start with His Word. Matthew 7, 24, Jesus says this. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And then he goes on to say this, that anybody who does not do this it's like a man who builds his house on sand. The, the wind and the rain come and washes it out. Jesus is saying this. If you live the word, if you hear it and you apply it to your life, your life is going to be unshakable. You will be undefeated. You will be unbeatable. Nothing can touch you. But he says if you don't, then, your house, then what you're going to be building is like a house built on sand. Something small comes like wind or rain and it's going to knock it over. 
We've got to start here with the Word. And uh, if there's one thing I want, want us all to hear tonight, there's, this is what I want us to hear right here. You cannot, we cannot pretend, we cannot pretend to know God or presume that we're living how He wants us to live or grow up in our faith. From a baby Christian to a functioning adult leader, influencer, a follower of Jesus, if we are not daily intaking and living out of this world. It's just not possible. And so our next stop in our growth has to start right here. And if you think about this meeting, like why are we having this meeting? Why do we do meetings every Monday night? We've done that for years on end. Well, the motivation behind it, isn't that just a, a group of people came together and said, oh, let's, this, would be, this would be nice to get people around. Let's just talk about some things together. No, it comes from... From the word, Matthew 9, 36 through 38, Jesus looks at a group of people and he says, hey, they're harassed and helpless. Then he turns to the, the guys who are following and he says, hey, we need more leaders out there sharing about how important this word is, sharing about how important a relationship with Christ is. Hence, a meeting like this every Monday night. The reason why we got a meeting like this because of the word. We think about even the focus of growth this semester, the next couple of weeks of what we're going to be doing. Like, why, why would you spend a semester... Focusing on growth and maturity and walking deeper and deeper with God. Well, it's the word. Colossians 2, 6, and 7 says that if you place your, your faith in Christ, don't let it stop there. Continue in your faith. Dig those roots deep. Dig those as deep as you possibly can. Continue to grow up. Continue to mature in your faith. The reason why we're focusing on growth this semester comes straight from the word. What about the person who invited you here? You guys ever wanted that question? It's like, maybe you just showed up and someone invited you. Why do they keep inviting me to this Monday night? Well, I bet you it has something to do with Matthew 22, which says, love God with all of your heart, with all your strength, with all of your mind. And the second commandment is, the second is just as great. Love others as you love yourself. And guess what they probably know? They probably know there's something special in a relationship with God that's freeing them from sin, that's given them a life of hope, a future, and they want to share that with somebody. It's because of the word that they invited you here, tonight. Think about even for yourself. Maybe you didn't get invited. Think about yourself. Why am I here? Why did I show up? Why did you guys show up? Why did, why did you show up to that faith discussion in your dorm or in your fraternity or in your sorority? You might not know the answer to that question, but I do. I know the answer. It's not because I got some anointing and I'm not some, some uh, anointed priest up here. I'm just a normal, pretty ordinary guy. Some guy, Southern Kansas, Bronson, Kansas. Small town education, so I'm not like the most wise, smart dude in the world. But I know the answer. You know, I have the word. John 6, 44 says that nobody comes to the Father unless he draws them to himself. You're here because God has drawn you to himself. He's working with every single one of us right near, right now. We showed up, and God is working even as we're in here. You know, if that's the case... The one thing that I know needs to be true, if we want to keep moving forward, if we want to keep maturing, if we want to really hit those next steps, we got to be convinced of God's Word. we got to be convinced of God's Word. That it's Him who spoke it. That it's actually what gives us life. That when I hear it and I listen to it, the obedience there, that God's going to do something with it. I've got to be convinced of God's Word. And if we're convinced of God's Word, What's going to happen to our lives, what our lives are going to look like, the time spent in God's Word, is we're going to be eager to intake God's Word. We're going to be eager to live it out. We're going to be eager to intake it and to live it out. And i got three reasons why we should be eager to intake it and live it out. The first one is this. We should be eager to intake this Word and live it out because He wants to speak to us. I hear, I see the Bible sometimes, and I think... Man, I should read that. Man, I should probably like get that on, on my mind. I should probably spend time in it. But have you ever stopped for a second and, and thought about the fact that God actually wants to spend time with you? And God actually wants to share his thoughts with you? He really does. He desires it from the bottom of his heart. He really does want to speak to us. And God's spoken throughout history in a lot of different ways. So I'm, I'm going to make this really simple. It's going to seem confusing here at first. But I'm going to simplify it. Believe me. 
Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 says this. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he spoke to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of uh, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. Sustaining all things through His Word. It all hinges on this. Let's think about that. Our, our faith, what we believe, the reason why I'm standing up here today sharing this, it, it hinges on this, on His powerful Word. Simplify what, what's going on right there. It said this. God used to speak to one person at a time. And he would speak to that one person and say, he would say, share what I just shared with you to all of these people. He'd just do it at one person at a time. That seems pretty impractical, right? When well, there's billions of people on the earth, pretty impractical just to speak to one person at a time. And you see this throughout history. Moses, if you know anything about Moses, he spoke to Moses through a burning bush. He spoke to... Uh, Elijah with just a still small voice. He spoke to Isaiah in a heavenly vision, a big heavenly vision. That's how he spoke to Isaiah. Hosea, through a family crisis, this is the one that cracks me up. He spoke to this guy named Amos. He spoke to him, and imagine Amos. He's in the scenario and he hears God's voice. And at that point, you can infer that he knew about the heroes of the past. So he knew about Moses and the fire. He knew about Isaiah and the heavenly vision. He hears God's voice. He's like, God, I hear you. Where are you, like, where are you at? This is my moment. Like, he'd been waiting for that moment. And he's like, he hears his voice. He's like, where are you at, God? Are you in the sky? Are you in my head? Are you, you know, you, you in the clouds? Where are you at? And he says, hey, look down here. I'm in the bowl of fruit. I'm speaking through the mango. Uh, so that's where I'm at. I'm speaking through a bowl of fruit. God used a bowl of fruit to speak to Amos. He could have done whatever he wanted. I would have been pretty disappointed if I was Amos. But, you know what? It's God speaking to you, so you've got to take it for what it is. But God doesn't primarily do that anymore. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 through 17 says this. All Scripture, everything in between these covers are God breathed. These are, these are his very words. Not only are they God breathed, but they're profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. Basically, what he's saying is, I've breathed all of these words, they're all mine, and guess what? They're sufficient for every area of life. Anything and everything that you're going through right now, I've got something in here for you. The things that you're looking for, I've got something in here for you. The deepest desires of our soul, they're in here. God's got them written down for us. And it's actually pretty genius if you think about it. He spoke to one person at a time. They had to speak to a, a millions of people. But now, put it in this little book here, millions of people can be reading exactly what God wants them to hear at the exact same time. God can be, be there meeting with them in this word. It's kind of cool to think about. I mean, to think about God's word. And I think one of the challenging things to me when I think about this is not just the view as literary work or homework or, or something that I'm just going to internalize and maybe it'll help me be more philosophical or, or smarter. No, I think what God wants us to see is his desire to speak to us. It's not just words on a page. He's on the other side of this. One of the, one of the uh, uh, best pictures that I've ever seen of this, an artist drew this. I wish I knew the, the artist's name. But I thought that was one of the greatest pictures of what God's actually trying to communicate with why he wants us to spend time in this. Because it's not just a book of material. He's on the other side. And he wants to share that. Everything he has with us. God's on the other side. He's speaking to us. And actually this simple communication is pretty easy. We do this all the time. We have dialogues with people. We communicate with people. Um, I was going to have my buddy Caleb come up here. All right, Caleb, come up here. Do we have a mic from Caleb? You will run that up here? So what Caleb and I are going to do, we're just going to have a, a little conversation. I'm going to show you how easy this actually is. Um, and uh, Caleb, thanks for coming up, man. Bro, I really appreciate it. Test. Caleb. Hey, give it up for Caleb, all right? Yeah. Caleb, Caleb, is this your first time on stage? 
Oh, yeah? Okay. Hey, well, I, I appreciate that. You're not going way back, man, like like way back. six months or something like that. Oh, yeah, a long time. But uh, I'm used to, like, communicating to you in my actual my apartment. That's pretty much, yeah, we hang out in the apartment, we eat pizza, we talk a little bit about fate, watch a lot of, like, Chiefs highlights, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, hey, I just had a question, quick, couple quick questions for you, right? First question is, is how you doing, man? You know, I'm doing pretty good. I, I like to think I'm doing good at least. Yeah, you look good, man. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, let me ask you this. With Tang, what do you think about Tang, and how far do you think we'll make it in the, uh, the March Madness? Uh, I think Tang's a dog. I think we're going all the way this year. Yeah. yeah. Number one next. Hey, we number five. It's the poll. Yeah, number one yeah. next. I, I, I'd say there'd be an argument for even maybe being two or three. How you feel about that? I think you're right. Okay, yeah. Hey, okay, you shouldn't be top ten either. No, no, no get them out. Can't okay, you get them out, man? All right, hey, well, you know, we're we're good friends at this point, right? And so, one of the things I, I like to ask my good friends is just like, hey, what are things you like to do? Because if, if you like to do some things, I like to do it too. You know, I'm pretty good at procrastinating, wasting time. I like doing that. And I like doing it with my boys over here. You like? I like doing both of those things. That's good. This is gonna work, man. That's good. Okay, so that was a great. Normal interaction, right? Have you seen that happen before? Yeah, it's a good conversation. Now, let's just replay it back one time, okay? Let's do it a little differently. I'm going to ask you some similar questions, all right? So, hey, hey, Caleb, how you doing, man? You know, Dude, I'm, that's great, man. That's great. I, uh, hey, I'm doing well, too. That's good. You know, I, it's kind of awkward that we have to have this conversation in front of a bunch of people, but, but uh, at least it's you and I together up here, right? How do you think, uh, what do you think about Tang and like how far we're going to make it? I think that we should probably, I think that we'd probably be like top three and we're probably going to win the whole thing. So I'm glad we could be on that. Um, dude, what do you like to do? I uh, love golfing. <laughs> golfing and hanging out with the bros. So hey, I, I, you like that too? I like that. Good, good. That's good. I give it up for Caleb. That was a great conversation. That was very productive, right? The reason why I do that is because as idiotic as that looked, that second conversation, how often do we do that to God? For real, how often do we do that to God? Where we come to God and we ask questions like, God, what should I do? What should I do in this situation? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? Why is this happening? And I, and, and I think we genuinely, all of us, to some degree, genuinely ask that question to God and then we just sit there and we wait. No response, no response, nobody's speaking from a mango, no response, no response. And then we give up. And then we either move on, just kind of keep living, and say, hey God, God didn't really have anything to say. He's irrelevant. I don't really care what he has to say at this point. Or maybe we move on and say, hey, well, you know what? God wasn't like super clear, so I'm just going to try to figure it out and do what I want. But the realization that we've got to have is this. you got his word right here. On the other side of this stand is God himself. And when I ask that question, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond in this situation? What do you want me to do with my life? You know the greatest thing we can do in that moment? Pick this thing up. Pick this thing up, start looking through it, trying to find out what God has to speak about that concern or about that question, because I guarantee you there's something in here for you. God wants to speak to us. He's made that really, really clear. When we don't show up, this is a crazy thought, when we don't show up to spend time with God or listen to Him, God's still there. Like he's still there. Even when we go to them, God is still there. You go a month, you go a year, you go a lifetime. You go a lifetime. I can't, I can't even fathom that. You go a lifetime. God was sitting there the whole time waiting. He was just waiting. He said, like, Caleb, I, I hope you speak. I hope you pick up my Bible. I've got something to say to you. He said, Ethan, I hope you pick up my Bible. I've got something to say to you. Jake, same thing. I've got something to say to you. Just pick up a word. The question I always like to ask myself too is if I don't feel God's presence or I don't sense His presence, the question is who moved? Was it God or was it me? Who moved? God never moved. 
It's always us that takes that step away from Him. We like to ask, where are you, God, in tough scenarios? But the better question is, where are we? Where are we? God has never moved. He says it in His Word. If you, if you pick it up, He says, I've never left. In fact, He says, I'm always with you to the very end of the age. If you want to get to know somebody, you've got to be near them. You've got to be close to them. You've got to be near them to hear them. And I promise you, I'm not making this stuff up. It does change people's lives for, for the better when you pick this up and, and you get close and you get personal to it and you experience God with it. And so I want to bring up someone. Her name's Quincy. And I want to let her share her experience about how she's interacted and experienced God. So go ahead, go ahead and welcome up Quincy. Yeah, hey guys, so like Jordan said, my name is Quincy, and to start off, I actually have a question for you all. So in high school, did any of you guys have to read one of those books in English class that made you like, just like disdain reading? You know, like the really dry ones, um, the really boring, just hard to read ones. Um, I don't know if anyone had to read 1984, but yeah, yes. Uh, it's just a really hard read. Um, like, I'm sure a lot of you felt this, but you just, it's hard to relate to. And honestly, in a lot of ways, uh, the same ways that I felt about 1984, kind of felt those same ways about the Bible. If I'm being truthful, I kind of just looked at the Bible as like, you know, a good advice book. It had some good stuff in there, you know, like love people, but not really anything that I felt like truly related to my life or what I was going through. And definitely not anything that I thought was like historically or scientifically accurate. And so I'm sure you can imagine my surprise when some friends who were in my sorority actually asked me to read the Bible with them. Uh, you know, I definitely did not join a sorority to read the Bible, but I was like, you know, I might as well. And so we ended up reading a passage together, and just right off the bat, they were talking about how it applied to their life and asking me some pretty deep questions, which honestly really did get me thinking, but I was kind of like just stuck in this, like I didn't understand why they took it so seriously and I was like in this headspace of like guys like it's not that deep um, and so I was kind of also wrapped up in the idea that I just didn't think that the Bible was reliable at all so of course I told them this and I argued with them about pretty much anything they would say to me um, but thankfully they pointed me in the direction of some really helpful resources and for the first time ever I started to look into the reliability of the Bible um, and it's really awkward looking back now because, like I said, I argued with them so much about the reliability of the Bible just to find out they were actually right. So um, I ended up, you know, having to face the music, kind of like just the fact that, you know, if the Bible was true, like I just found out, that means that my need for God was true, uh, what Jesus did on the cross for me was true, and the fact that, like, God wanted a personal relationship with me was true. And so that was around the time that I made the decision to just completely trust in God with my life and my decisions. But if I'm being honest, even after making that decision, I just didn't really want to read the Bible. Uh, I knew it was how I was going to learn about God, but I just didn't have a desire to read it. And so it was actually about this time last year, you know, I'm in my Haymaker dorm room and I am, like, I gotta read something. So I pulled up the Bible app on my phone, begrudgingly, and I was like, I think I heard of this book, like Philippians or something. So it's like, you know, I might as well check that one out. So I pull it up and it starts out with this like little intro page that talks about just what the book even is about. So start reading and it says that the book is about this guy who's like imprisoned by Rome and he's writing to this Roman colony and they're like facing opposition because they're supporting him. And for the first time I was kind of like, wow, this is, this is actually kind of interesting. Uh, so I continued reading and I found that there were some verses that actually talked about anxiety. And this really related to me just in my life at that point. Um, anxiety was something that had just really taken control of my life and I just really struggled with for a really long time and I just had a lot of stuff just continuing to pile up in my life you know like family conflict bad ending to a relationship and just all the stressors that come with being a freshman in college 
And so I started reading Philippians like almost every day actually, uh, specifically Philippians 4, 6, and 7, which talks about bringing your anxieties to God um, through prayer and that he wants to bring you peace when you come to him in prayer with your anxieties. And so just reading this in a time where I felt like my anxiety was just a hole that I couldn't dig myself out of. Um, I was able to just realize that, you know, God doesn't want me to bear all of my anxieties on my own. And that I don't need to take care of everything by myself because, like, God loves me and he's there for me and he always will be there for me. And, um, you know, I, was, I realized at this point, you know, I wouldn't have figured that out. I wouldn't have figured out that the Bible related to me in this way if I wouldn't have first decided to read it. So this was kind of the point that I decided to make reading my Bible a priority in my life. And I'm honestly just really glad I did because um, I've just really been able to learn so much more about God's character and just the fact that he wants to have a deep and meaningful relationship with me through reading my Bible. But yeah, thanks so much guys. I'm gonna get it back to Jordan. Things I liked about that. There was a couple different times in that story where she just said, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to get in the Word. Second thing is she experienced true life from it. She said peace actually came from it. It's a peace in that verse she was talking about. It's a peace that transcends all understanding. Basically what that verse is saying is you, you can't get this or understand it unless you're reading it and applying it and living it. But there's a, a real peace that, that brought life. And that's actually the second point. So good, good job, Quincy, leading us into the second point here. His word leads us to true life. Not only does God want to speak to us, so that's his perspective. But from our perspective, that should give us a desire of one to, to go hard after him. It's like the God of the universe wants to speak to me. That's amazing. I'm going to take that up. But the second thing is this actually leads us to true life. Now that's an ambiguous term. Just throw out life. Yeah, it's going to give you life. But what does he actually mean when, when he says, I'm going to give you life through this? I think if we break it down to find it, life is a security, safety, pleasure, satisfaction, uh, satisfaction, fulfillment, peace, joy, and completeness. God's saying this, everything that you've ever wanted or desired, deepest parts of your soul, I can give it to you, but the real version of it. The real version of it. Everything else is knockoff brand. It's hollow. It's empty. But if you seek this and you live this out, I will give you the real version of it. And so when you listen to them, there's success that comes with it. This makes me think about uh, my brother. And so one of the things I like to do, if you know anything about me, I've got car issues. You know, I'm, I'm going from car to car to car to car to car. Um, People are laughing because they know it's true. But they don't know that I'm pretty savvy with cars too. And so I, I kind of like pride myself on finding the best deals. And so I was looking for some of the, the best deals. I had a Nissan Altima, a deer ran out in front of it and it hit me. I didn't hit it. It was the deer's fault. And it totaled the car. And so I was like, oh, perfect. This is a great opportunity to start doing some investigating. I always wanted to like look for the best deal. And I ended up finding one that was pretty awesome. And I got this little broker guy from Oregon. And I, I like did this auction against this dude in Mexico, I think. And, uh, and we're like going back. <laughs> this is hilarious. We're like going back and forth trying to get this car. He like up me and I'm like, well, I'll, I'll if you want to. And so it's a uh, dealer's only, which is hilarious because I don't have a deal dealer's license. <laughs> But uh, this broker did, and so I'm just, I paid 200 bucks to get the broker to pay, ended up winning it, right? This is amazing. So my brother saw how I did that, and I got this amazing deal through it. He's like, oh, I'm going to do that too. And I was like, hey, I've learned so much from this, this experience, please, like, if you do it, like, send that information across my table. I've got some info that you're going to want to know about. I can tell you yes or no in five minutes whether or not you should get that car. And about a couple weeks later, I just got this picture of this car. No word from him. Like, no word. And I just saw the picture. I was like, oh, my, oh my gosh. <laughs> this cannot be good. Like, he just went out on a limb and he, he bought this car on his own. He said, he, he, well, he didn't say anything initially. I just knew it was bad when he sent me this picture. 
But he texted me right after it and he said, you guys can't see this, but I'll read it. He said, here's a picture of my hunk of crap. Beauty on the outside, decaying on the inside. And I texted him back and I was like, dude, I told you, bro. I told you. It showed up on his uh, driveway, it was, the, the motor was like purring and it wasn't even on. It wasn't even on. It was just like, mm. it's like making these noises. I was like, dude, I told you so. God, he's not the, the type of person who will hold it over your head like I did with my brother and say, I told you so. But when we experience life and it doesn't make sense and it's confusing and on the other end of it, end of it is just destruction and hurt and pain, God says, I, I told you so. Not in a, a hurtful way, in a loving way. He said, I, I told you, I, I actually spoke about that in this. Like, you didn't, you didn't have to go down that, that route. I, I talked about that in this word. God's concern for us is that we would know Him, honor Him, but we would experience life the way it's meant to be. God told us so. John 6, 63, it says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. This word life, if you actually look at Greek word up, it's amazing. It means this life real and genuine, a life active and vigorous, devoted to God and after the resurrection, a more perfect body that will last forever. God's saying this, your life doesn't have to be about just surviving. I want your life to thrive. You don't have to just survive. I want your life to thrive. But as long as it's outside of this word, it's just going to be surviving. And it's going to be surviving until that last breath, unless we pick it up. We change our direction. We listen to Him. God says it doesn't have to be just surviving. It can be thriving as well. God's Word in that verse, if we go back to it, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Therefore, flesh, everything outside of the Word, nothing, hollow, empty. Jesus' words, life, real, genuine, vigorous, thriving, when I hear that, I want that. I want Jesus' words. I wanted it in 2012 when I first came to Christ. 18 years old. I actually know it in 2010. 2010. 18 years old. I told you, Southern Kansas, Wellington, to Kansas education. So we're going to math. When I hear these words, I want it. Do you guys want that? God wants it for us. Everything we ever wanted, everything we ever desired, everything that we will need is found in these words. And uh, a couple of years ago, I actually gave a talk similar to this at a Kaleo. So if any of you guys have heard of Kaleo, I don't know if there's a better way to learn how to actually unpack the word and study it. This Greek stuff that I threw up here, you're like, oh, that's pretty fancy. He threw some Greek up there. Believe me, it's pretty easy. Go down to Kaleo and you'll learn how to do this. Once you see how to do it, you're like, oh, well, I could actually probably do that. I believe y'all could do that. Get up here and give this. But uh, I asked a couple of people, a few, um, what their experience was like when they first started engaging and interacting with God. How did they receive life from it and through it? And so this video was actually made at Kaleo 2019. And so some of these students are probably actually graduated not from the real world, but these are some of the first interactions that they had engaging with God and receiving life from us. So check it out. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Enough said, right? I love that. <laughs> He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. Enough said. And us, I mean, that, I could have, I could have asked a, a number of people down there and they could have shared their experience with God um, in, in how he gives them life. And if that's the case, what does it look like to make it happen? If God is actually wanting to give us life through this, I think one thing we can do is practice the pursuit of God's word in all aspects of our life, try memorizing it. God didn't just want us to, to have a time with Him and, and gain from His Word and then get up and go. No, He's saying, hey, every aspect of your life, I've got something to say about it. And uh, I've, I've told this to my guys uh, that meets on Wednesday night. I say, one thing we want to do is be, we want to have a knee-jerk reaction to be like Christ. I'm like, what's a knee-jerk reaction? It's like when you get hit, you know, on the knee, you know what I'm talking about? When the doctors do that, your knee goes up. What God wants us to do is He wants our knee-jerk reaction to be His Word, to be life. 
The only way that I've found that that actually happens really well is when I actually put it in my heart and in my mind. And I do it, what God actually says to do with this word. He says, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. To press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home. And when you walk along the road. When you lie down. And when you get up. Tie them to symbols on your hands and bind them to the foreheads. He goes as far as say, bind it to your forehead. Put it on your forehead. That's what I want you to do with my word. There's not like a, a second today that he's not talking about there. He says he wants stuff on your heart and your mind. One way to do that is to memorize it. And I don't have any fancy way to do that. It's just like defense. Basketball, you're playing like defense. You just gotta, it's like, it's work ethic, right? Hard work, put the, the time in. I guarantee you it will be worth it. Third, final point here of why we should pursue uh, God and his word is this. His word is our lamp and a light to our path. One of my favorite verses that I heard as a kid growing up, for some reason it just stuck with me. Maybe it was because it was visual. But Psalm 115, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And like the more I thought about it, it's a simple verse. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, man, that is good. That is good. Your word is a lamp. It's the light. It's the thing that makes things around me in a dark room clear. It's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so when I'm holding that lamp, I've got one of these fancy lamps. This is one of my favorite prized possessions here. It kind of reminds me, kind of reminds me when I see this, is that God's word is this for my life. When you turn it on, and when you turn it off, you can't really see it, it's not very bright. But when you turn this thing on, and when you turn this thing off, God's saying, that's like you opening and closing my word. And I was thinking about this. If you've got a lamp, Usually you're needing a lamp in a dark place. And it makes sense why the psalmist is writing this. He's saying, hey, you're in a world that is dark and it's confusing. There's a, a, a quote, I don't even know exactly who it's from, and I wish I did because it's, it's so good. But it says this, it is impossible to walk the path of life not knowing where our steps fall. We don't know if our foot will step on good ground or on dangerous ground. We are not self-aware. God's word will be the lamp to our feet. Amazing. Thank you. God's word, he's saying this. When you're making decisions, if you're making decisions without it, it's like walking around in a dark room. When you open your word and you apply it, it's like turning that light on. Me not being in the word consistently is like turning the light off and making decisions in the darkness. You have these like mental battles and wrestles with God sometimes in life. Like, why is this happening? What do I do next? And sometimes we struggle to trust God's word. That's real. That's real. I, I feel that. I struggle to trust God's word sometimes. But when that happens, God likes to remind me what he says about himself and about his word in his word. There's a lot of things about his word, but he does communicate what he thinks about that. So Jordan, remember this. Remember that my word is alive. Like, it's active. Remember that my word is breathed out. I've wrote every one of these words very intentionally. Remember that it endures forever. And that everything that you do in line with this will endure forever as well. It's perfect. It's flawless. It is your shield. It will protect you if you let it. It will be solid ground for you if you trust it. It will help you understand what's going on in a, a chaotic world. It will be food to your soul. If you're feeling empty, fill yourself up with real food. It's right. This word, it is true. It is life. It's wisdom. It's knowledge. It's freedom from sin. It's freedom from entanglement. It's freedom from hurt and pain. Freedom to live a life that God has actually called us to live. It's your help. It'll sustain you. It'll sustain all. It's full of grace. It's the thing that leads people to salvation. The most important thing that, that can be true of any person is learning about the salvation of their souls. Jesus died for them on a cross. He was raised again so they can have eternal life. This work points you to how you can actually accept that and live it out. It'll give you vision for your life. It'll give you a blueprint, a blueprint to redeem the world back to God. 
when you're struggling the most, even in the midst of some of those, those decisions or those moments of trusting God's word, I think the final thing he wants you to remember about his word is that it's, it's him. This is God. It's me. It's what God says. You can listen to me. You can learn from me from this word. So if that's the case, make it happen. Turn on the lamp every day by living out the word through intentional application. It'd be kind of dumb if I pick this up and I turn it on in a dark room and I said, now I can see. Now I can find my way. And then to put it down and to start walking, where are you at at that point? You're back in darkness. That's like reading the word and not applying it. But reading the word and applying it is picking it back up and saying, no, I'm going to take one step at a time. Trust in you, God. Your word. It's going to light. It's going to illuminate my path. I'm going to follow it. We need to pick it up. We need to hear it. We need to live it, learn it, and then make intentional application. I think a good thought to think through with your time with God is this. I'm listening. I'm reading the word. I don't want to get up from this time unchanged. I never want to leave a time in the Word unchanged. Being a person of application will help us to be those type of people who are changed by God. And we can do it. It's an amazing thing to think about. We've all got access to it. It's not that hard. It's pretty simple. It's just taking a few minutes, opening this thing up, reading it, saying, God, what do you have for me today? Okay, how do I live that out? We can all do this. And if we do it, the direction of our life, its significance, its fulfillment, its meaning, it will all be determined by how we handle the Word of God. How will y'all handle it? Let me pray for us, and then we're going to have some time to talk about it. God, thank you for your Word. Thank you for this opportunity to even just talk about it, God. We know that you have divinely even just shared your thoughts about life, God. And I pray that every single one of us, God, would be eager to intake it, God, we'd be eager to live it out. God, we wouldn't leave it unchanged. We would take it. We'd, we'd know it, God. We'd hear from you. We'd see you behind the words, God. We'd see you in it all. And that we would leave to change or make an intentional application from this thing, God. It's changed my life. It's changed millions. There are people all over the world that would die just to have a piece of this in their hands. God, we've got full access to it. I pray that we take advantage of it. In your name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and talk about this for a few minutes, and then we're going to have a couple people come up and wrap it up.